news of David's victory spread like wildfire, and David became well known throughout the land. He was soon invited to meet King Saul in Jerusalem, where he also met the king's son, Jonathan. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. As a token of his loyalty, Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow and his belt. The people of Israel continued to praise David, singing and dancing in the streets. King Saul became angry and jealous and even tried to kill David. After escaping to a place called Ramah, David met with Jonathan. Jonathan said to David, whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. So they devised a plan to gauge Saul's intentions. At the new moon feast, Jonathan would tell Saul that David had gone to Bethlehem to offer an annual sacrifice. If Saul was pleased, then David was safe to return. But if Saul was angry, they would know he intended to harm David. David was very concerned that the latter would be true and that Jonathan, being Saul's son and heir to the throne, might not reveal the outcome to him. Never, Jonathan said. If I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? To prove his loyalty to David, Jonathan made a covenant with him, saying, If my father intends to harm you, may the Lord deal with Jonathan, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away in peace. So Jonathan told David to hide by a large rock in a field until after the festival. He would shoot arrows towards the rock as if he were practicing with the target, sending a boy to retrieve them. If the arrow fell short, it would be safe for David to return. If the arrow went beyond the rock, David would be in danger and should flee. Then Jonathan went back to the palace. During the banquet, he told Saul that David had gone to Bethlehem to offer a sacrifice. Saul became enraged and demanded that David be found and killed. On that second day of the feast, Jonathan did not eat because he was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of David. The next morning, Jonathan went out with his servant to the field where David was hiding. He shot arrows far beyond the rock, giving David the signal to run away. Then Jonathan told his servant to leave. After the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left and Jonathan went back to the town. I am a man discovering destiny. I am a father leaving a legacy. I am the King of Israel. I am David. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that reception. Welcome to Cafe Church. It's uh, great to be sharing with you. It's a real privilege to be sharing with you on part three of this sermon series where we are looking at the life of David. And as we heard in the summary there, we're looking uh, specifically at this friendship between David and Jonathan and how this friendship enabled David to discover his destiny, to, to find and fulfill the calling that God had on his life. Now, when I say the word friendship, I'm sure that can conjure up all kinds of thoughts and feelings and emotions. Maybe for one or two of you, uh, some people come to mind. And uh, in preparation for this talk, I took the liberty of looking up some quotes of what culture has thought about friendship over the years. So maybe one or two of these will resonate with you um, as I read them out. The first one comes from Charles Lamb, who says this, It's the privilege of friendship to talk nonsense and to have nonsense respected. I think we can all empathize with that when we're having a good old rant with uh, one of our friends and we really don't know what we're talking about. Um, the second one comes from a Sicilian proverb that says, only your real friends will tell you when you've got food stuck in your teeth. You know you're close with somebody when you can tell them they've got food stuck in their teeth, right? Um, the third one comes from Marceline Cox who says this, one sure way to lose another woman's friendship is to try to improve her flower arrangements. <laughs> Um, I think that one's for my mum, definitely. Um, sorry, mum. Uh, the final one is from Otto von Bismarck, who says, Love is blind, but friendship tries not to notice. 
Um, that's a thinker, that one. Um, uh, but uh, as, as true as these statements are, um, I believe that there's something very rich, very valuable about friendship, um, that if, if we don't have it in our life, it's truly missed. It's something that is quite unique in our lives. You see, we live in a culture uh, that is increasingly well-connected, you know, with social media, with, with technology and so forth, but at the same time is becoming increasingly lonely. Now, I think the reason why that is is because um, our culture just isn't, I suppose, fascinated by friendship anymore. I read an article recently that said that the reason why this is is because we're just not, I suppose, um, you know, enthralled with friendship. It doesn't really excite us, I suppose. And to use, a, I suppose, a, an intellectual analogy, um, just think about the amount of romantic films that are brought out every single year. You know, romance is a relationship that, I suppose, excites our culture, isn't it? I'm a faithful husband. I've watched my fair amount of romantic comedy films over the years. But surely, come on, there's only a certain number of ways in which two people can, can get together. But we keep churning them out every single year. But by contrast, if you think about the, the number or lack of films that are made about friendship, you know, arguably the most famous story about friendship, The Lord of the Rings, when, when it was turned um, into a film, had to have a romantic storyline kind of embellished to, to kind of enhance and, and kind of enthrall the audience, the culture that we live in. But I want to say to you today that friendship is something that is unique. It brings something into our life that other kinds of relationships, romantic, family, communal, and so forth, that they can't. It's unique. And I think that it's not something that's optional in our life. It's something that is essential for succeeding in our lifetimes. Now, when I talk about um, loneliness, uh, for some of you here today, that may, for whatever reason, may resonate with you. And it might be a decision for you to make today to say, I want to start or I want to get back onto that journey of friendship again today. Or you might be here and you might say, well, I enjoy some, some great friendship. And that's fantastic. But, you know, we can always be better friends, can't we? We can always embark and venture onto this, this wonderful journey of friendship together. And I want to give us a statement today, a take-home statement that I think applies to all of us here today, which is this. I want to encourage us to be the friends that we need to be in order to gain the friends that we need to have. Be the friends that we need to be in order to gain the friends that we need to have. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, I believe that there are a number of be attitudes, if you like. Attitudes that if we employ in our life will enable us to, to reap the, the fruits, the wonderful benefits of friendship to discover our destinies in life, and to help others, just like Jonathan helps David here, help others to discover their destiny as well. Now, the first beatitude is, is an attitude that is foundational to friendship. It should form the foundation of every friendship that you are uh, involved in, and that is this. Be united. Be united. Now, at the beginning of, of this uh, story, this summary, we hear about David after this amazing victory with, uh, against Goliath, as we heard about last week. He's summoned to the palace. He's won the attention of King Saul. Um, and it's here that he speaks with Saul and his family. And this is what we read in 1 Samuel 18, verse 1. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. Now, the beauty of friendship is that it requires, I suppose, a common affinity, a common love, a, a foundation of unity um, that can only, I suppose, be discovered. It can't be created. The two of you as friends have to discover this for yourself. C.S. Lewis, in his famous essay on friendship, said this. He said, friendship is born at the moment when one person says to another, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. How many of us can relate to that? Thinking back to some of the friendships that we've enjoyed, uh, we enjoy today, how they first began. When you first turn to one another and you say, what, you too? You also think that too? You also love that too? You're also as crazy as I am? You know, I thought I was the only one. What's that? You also think Man City are absolutely rubbish? Let's be friends. Uh, let's be best friends, if that's you out there. Um, but if you, uh, if you read um, the first few chapters of 1 Samuel, you'll realize that, that Jonathan 
uh, up until this point, was probably the only person in Israel who thought he had a vision for the nation, who thought he wanted to fulfill God's plan for this nation. That is, up until he meets David. And here we see, after hearing him speak, he saw him, Jonathan was there in battle, and saw David defeat Goliath, and he hears him speak at the palace, at length probably. After this, he realizes they have this common affinity. They both have minds that believe the same truths. They both have wills that are locked onto the same purpose. They both have emotions that respond to the same injustices. They were both united together. They loved the same God. They were committed to the same kingdom. They marched the same way. They shared the same dream. They had the same vision. They were united together. Now, this is what is unique about friendship. Because, you see, I suppose if you're thinking about romantic relationships again, you know, lovers are always talking about their relationship, aren't they? They're always talking about how much they love each other. You know, I'm, a, I'm obviously a romantic, so, so I'm always talking to Chrissy, my wife, about how much I love her, how wonderful it is to be married to her. Well, well I try to, at least. Um, but, you know, friends, friends don't do this, do they? Friends don't kind of meet up and say, oh, let's grab a coffee, because I just think we need to kind of talk about our friendship. Um, it would be a bit odd, wouldn't it? You know, that friendship probably wouldn't last for, for much longer. But you see... Like lovers, I suppose, are face to face, aren't they? They, they look at each other, they're, they're absorbed with one another. But friends are, are side by side, they're shoulder to shoulder. They're absorbed in like a, a common interest, a common affinity that unifies them together. And what is so wonderful and unique about this is that this unity transcends their culture, background, personality type, race, social standing, whatever it is. You see here we have Jonathan, who is a member of the royal family. He's royalty, befriending David, who, as we know, is a shepherd boy. They're poles apart on the, on the social standing like spectrum, I suppose. And yet they are one in spirit. They are best friends. That's wonderful, isn't it, about friendship? It transcends these things. So number one, be united. The second B attitude is be committed. Be committed. In the book of Proverbs, it says that a friend loves at all times. Good times, bad times, ordinary times. A friend is somebody who is committed to you, is steadfast in their support, unwavering in their commitment. Now, as we read in the, in the summary here, as you heard in the summary, that after King Saul first tries to kill David, David flees to a place called Ramah, and it's here where he meets with, uh, with Jonathan. And Jonathan hadn't seen Saul try to kill David, so David's trying to explain to Jonathan what is going on. You have David here getting worked up, kind of explaining to a somewhat bemused Jonathan that his father's gone crazy and now wants him dead. And all of this, as you see, as the story unfolds, begins to put pressure, begins to put tension and strain on their relationship. And you see here, David, as he's kind of laying out his worries and his anxieties to Jonathan, he's getting more and more worked up. And I love Jonathan's response. He just comes in with this kind of perfect antidote to this increasingly chaotic situation. This is what he says here. He says in, in chapter 20, verse 4, Jonathan said to David, whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. Now, this is a friend. When you're going through a difficult time, a difficult circumstance, when you're facing obstacles in life, in, in challenging situations, they just come in and say, what do you want me to do? Whatever it is, I'll do it for you. You see, we live in a culture today, I believe, that, that, that many people, I think, know each other because they are useful to them. Some are, some are useful for having a good time. Some are useful for getting things done. Others are useful, I suppose, for meeting other people. But you know, the difference between somebody who, who knows you because you're useful and a friend is when the chips are down, when it's going to take a lot of investment, a lot of expenditure to keep that relationship close. You see, it's at times like these where a companion or an associate would say, oh yeah, yeah, just, just call me if you need anything. But a friend is already there. Because a friend is somebody who hasn't seen you as a means to an end, but they see you as an end in yourself. Look at what Jonathan is saying here. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. I'm not going to let you, David, fall into ruin. I'm not going to let you not fulfill your destiny in life. I'll be there, whatever it costs me, whatever it takes. This is true friendship. It's true commitment. Now, as part of this commitment, it involves an emotional investment as well. 
You know, uh, these two are emotionally invested in one another. As we see, when, when Jonathan finds out from his father, King Saul, um, his intentions to kill David, he is emotionally uh, distraught. As we read at the festival here, it says, On that second day of the feast, Jonathan did not eat because he was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of David. To be committed is to invest in somebody emotionally. Friends cannot be emotionally disconnected from one another. And again, this is what is unique about friendship. You see, with family relationships or with romantic relationships, you're going to be emotionally invested in that person, kind of whether you like it or not. You know, if your mother or your father or brother, sister, whoever is kind of going through a tough time, then you're going to go through that with them, whether you like it or not. But with friendship, a friend, I suppose, gives you this emotional investment like as a gift. They give it voluntarily. Jonathan had given this to David. Look, he's at a feast, uh, a festival, and he can't even eat whilst he knows that David is in trouble. That's incredible emotional investment, isn't it? A friend gives it as a gift, and it means that they're committed to your emotional flourishing uh, because it's connected to their emotional flourishing as well. And as this story unfolds, we see just how emotionally connected these two guys are. Because the next day when Jonathan is able to give David that fatal signal that he's in trouble, that Saul's after him and wants him dead, just look at how this, to, how this news, I suppose, affects both of them. It says this, As soon as the boy was gone, David came out from where he'd been hiding near the stone pile. Then David bowed three times to Jonathan. With his face to the ground, both of them were in tears as they embraced each other and said goodbye, especially David. Now, this is the, the tear-jerking part of this story. These two now know that with King Saul intent on, on wanting David dead, they know that they can no longer hang out with each other. They have to depart from one another. And just look at how it, how it cuts them both to the core. And they have no problem, I suppose, with revealing this to each other. This is two grown men, grown men, weeping together, weeping together. Now, in our culture, you know, that might not seem normal. It might not seem, it might seem, you know, necessarily weak, I suppose. But, you know, this is a good thing. It's good to be emotionally invested because it, this doesn't show that these two are weak by any means. It shows that they care. To be a friend is to be committed, to be emotionally invested, to care for one another. It's a fruit, I suppose, of being committed, this emotional investment. So be united, be committed. Thirdly, be honest, be honest. If we go a little bit further back in the story, when Saul is trying, he tries to kill David and David flees, flees to that place called um, Ramah, or Ramah, as we say in Leicester. Um, he flees to this place um, in Ramah and he's, he's talking to uh, Jonathan and it's here where they devise a plan to kind of find out what Saul's intentions are. At this moment, they don't really know what his intentions are fully, so they devise a plan. And while they're talking, you notice David has, has a hesitation, a somewhat natural hesitation, because he suddenly realizes, well, I'm speaking with, with Saul's son, eldest son, and heir to the throne. And he suddenly realizes, well, what, what if his allegiances don't lay with me? What if actually he's in on this evil plan to kill me? What if he's with Saul and not with me? And he kind of lays this out openly to Jonathan. But again, look at Jonathan's response. This is fantastic. He says, never, Jonathan said, if I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? Now, to be a friend is to be honest, to be open, to be upfront. Look at what Jonathan is saying here. What I hear you will hear. What I know, you will know. This is true transparency. It's friendship. It's taking the mask off, being vulnerable with one another. Now, why can they do this? Well, if they're united, if they're committed, well, they know they're genuinely for one another. They can take the mask off. They don't have to be afraid. They don't have to be fearful of what each other think. They can truly kind of be open and honest with one another. Now, part of this being honest with each other is not being afraid, I suppose, to be candid with your friend, to tell them the truth even when it sometimes hurts them, to tell them, I suppose, what they need to hear as opposed to what they want to hear. 
as Jonathan, as his story unfolds, and Jonathan, I suppose, is kind of trying to prove to David where his allegiances lie, he makes a covenant with him, and he says this. He says, if my father intends to harm you, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away in peace. Now, what is going on here? Well, Jonathan is committing to telling David the truth, no matter how painful it may be. You see, there may be times in life where you have to tell your friend um, stuff like news and um, truth that is going to be difficult for them to hear, but nevertheless, they need to hear it. Now, you might say, well, well why? You know, what if I'm too afraid to kind of tell them that, that painful truth? Well, then you're not being a friend. Because you could say, well, I, I love that person too much to have to tell them the truth. And, and I love them too much to have to kind of reveal this painful truth to them. But if you do that, that can actually lead to, to devastation on your friend's part. If Jonathan hadn't told David the truth, the painful truth here, it could have led to devastation on his part and not him fulfilling his destiny. You see, sometimes I suppose when we say, I'm too, I, I love that person too much to have to tell them this, this hard stuff, what in fact we're saying is I love myself too much to have to go through that pain with them. Ralph Emerson, who's a famous 19th century theologian, said, I would rather be a nettle in my friend's side than his echo. Powerful words. I would rather be a nettle in my friend's side than his echo. You know, if we aren't going to be candid, I suppose, and be honest and upfront with our friends about their strengths and their weaknesses, then they might, they might make wrong decisions in life because they're going to make decisions based on who they think they are. And it could lead to one bad decision after another. But Jonathan understood this. He knew that the news of King Saul wanting to kill David would be terrible for him to hear. You know, how many of you agree, how many of you agree like getting news that the leader of a nation wants you dead isn't the best news to receive, right? Jonathan knows that he's not going to let David down, though, and he's committed to telling him the truth, no matter how painful it may be. You see, in a situation such as this, a person can either be, I suppose, um, overly emotional um, and not tell the truth and not tell them anything and just kind of be quiet. Or they can be on the other end of the spectrum and be just too candid, overly kind of critical, um, just speaking about weaknesses and, and love kind of doing that kind of stuff. And if you boil it down, it can just be sometimes rude. But a friend is in neither of those two positions because a friend is candid in kind of telling you the truth but because of their emotional investment in, in that person as well, they're going to go through that with them. Jonathan was going to go through this with David. And you see, this is why sometimes it can be difficult to, to be a friend. It's challenging being a friend sometimes. It's why we can't, I suppose, always have uh, lots and lots of this these types of friends. Jesus, I think, modeled it really well by having 12 disciples, 12 friends, um, you know, a, a relatively small number, and then within the, that 12, investing heavily in three. I think that's a good model for us to follow as well, because it takes that investment to be committed, to be honest and open. That is what it means to be a friend. So be united, be committed, be honest. And the final B attitude is be humble. Be humble. If we go right back to the start of this summary, we'll see something extraordinary between David and Jonathan. In 1 Samuel 18 verse 4 it says this, Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow and his belt. This is immediately after Jonathan has heard David speak with Saul, right at the beginning, the formation of their friendship. Now what is going on here? Well firstly, um, I mean, well overall, Jonathan is showing incredible humility on many levels. The first level is, as we've already established, here we have a member of the royal family who's befriending a shepherd boy, which in that time, in that culture, would have been incredibly countercultural. So he's showing humility on that level. Secondly, we notice he takes off his robe and gives it to David. Now, in that culture, to receive any kind of dress from the king or from his son and heir to the throne um, would have been deemed, in that culture, the highest honor that you could bestow upon an individual. But Jonathan doesn't stop there. Quite stunningly, it, this is extraordinary, is, is, the, is the act of him taking off his tunic, giving his sword, his bow, and his belt to David. Now, why is this important? Well, these items are kingly items. 
They're items that should only really be worn by a king or by a future king. Jonathan has the humility right at the start to see that David is going to be the future king of Israel. He has the lens of humility to look at David and see that the anointing is not on himself, but it's on David. Incredible humility. And he doesn't just, I suppose, confirm his commitment to David. He actually calls out and commissions him to live out his destiny in life. He calls out that anointing that he has to be the future king of Israel. Right from the start, this is what we see between Jonathan and David. When Jonathan looks at David, he doesn't see a shepherd boy. He sees the future king of Israel. You see, friends will always see you for how God sees you. Friends will always look at you and see what you can become. Not where you're at at the moment, but, but where, where God is calling you to. Friend will always call, friends will always call out that potential in you. Friends will always stand up for you behind your back. You read 1 Samuel 18 to 20. You see time and time again, Jonathan stands up for David in front of his father, King Saul. When David's not around, he stands up for him and speaks well of him time and time again. Friends will always see you for how God sees you. Now, as part of this being humble, it involves a a lack of competition, a lack of competition. Now, I don't want to confuse this with camaraderie. You know, camaraderie is where you are friends and you're kind of spurring one another on towards bigger and better things. But competition, I suppose, is where you're, you're succeeding at the expense of other people. Camaraderie is where you succeed because of other people. Allow me to illustrate. Uh, When I was at university, I was friends with a guy called Will. Um, And after having many of those uh, first, like, what, you two kind of moments, uh, we became very close friends. And we were studying the same subject of of law at university. And for those of you who don't know, it's it's a fiercely competitive subject uh, where the grade boundaries, like, rise and fall, dependent on how well the year is doing. So if everybody does really badly, then it kind of benefits you because the the boundaries go lower. Um, But if everybody does really well, then you have to kind of up your game because the boundaries go up. And so me and Will, we decided we were going to work together. We were going to share our work and kind of hold hold anything back. Um, And in in a kind of course where people are quite literally willing others to fail so they can succeed, this was, this was quite countercultural. But we realized that, that the more we were competitive, the more we were prideful, I suppose, with each other, the less likely it was that we were to succeed. But the more humble we were, the more we shared with one another, the more likely it was that we would succeed. And I'm pleased to say that at graduation time, we both did um, succeed. And it was really a special moment because we were happy for for ourselves, of course, but but happy for one another as well. Because there's a sense in which we'd laid aside personal agendas, chasing after the same outcome. Now, how important was it for David that Jonathan wasn't competitive? You know, it's important for me and Will uh, to not be competitive, you know, not to hold things back in order for us to succeed. But how much more important was it for for David that Jonathan didn't hold back, that Jonathan didn't hold on to his inheritance? You know, in earthly terms, Jonathan had every right to hold on to his inheritance. He was the eldest son, he he was the heir to the throne, but he laid aside his inheritance because he was humble. He was humble enough to see that the anointing was on David, not on himself. And when I was preparing for this, I was reading this passage just thinking, how could Jonathan display such levels of humility? This is incredible humility, isn't it? Laying aside his inheritance for for David's sake. And I think there's a clue at the last passage um, that we look at between these two, where these two are saying goodbye to one another. I think it reveals a clue as to why Jonathan was able to, to show such levels of humility. And I think it's this. Jonathan didn't have an earthly perspective. He had an eternal one. He didn't have an earthly perspective. He had an eternal one. Let's read this passage together. It said, At last Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn loyalty to each other in the Lord's name. The Lord is the witness of a bond between us and our children forever. Then David left, and Jonathan returned to the town. Now, it's clear from this passage, although these two kind of briefly meet in the future again, it's clear that at this moment in time, these two thought that this was the last time they would ever see each other on earth. Now, rather than being quite a sad occasion, this text is filled with so much hope because these two realize that they will be friends united forever. 
They will be friends united in a place of love and harmony where the former things uh, pass away. The former things of, of all this, this dealing with Saul, it will pass away and they will be friends united forevermore. They both were chasing after what God had called them to do. They weren't chasing after earthly gain, earthly glory. They were chasing after what God had called them to do. They knew that friends united in heart would be separated no more. It's incredible humility, isn't it? So these two friends show us what it means to, to be the friends that we need to be in order to have the friends that we need to have. Be united, be committed, be honest, be humble. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, Josh, this sounds incredible, um, and I'd love to experience this or, or be more like this, but, but you know, where are we going to get the, the strength to, I suppose, be the friends that we need to be in order to have the friends that we need to have? Because it's, it's quite demanding when you look at it on paper, isn't it? Well, the night before Jesus went to the cross, he was speaking to his disciples, speaking to his friends, and he was trying to get across to them the meaning, the reason for why he was going to go to the cross the following day, what he, why he was going to go through what he was going to go through. And one of the concepts he uses to try and, to try and reason with them is to use this concept of friendship. Now, as we read in John 15, we read here Jesus speaking to his disciples, and this is what he says. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. Since I have told you everything the Father told me, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Now when Jesus utters these words, the whole history of the world could be understood in terms of friendship. You see, God is a friendship. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And this is what Jesus is revealing here. And we, having been made in the image of God, we are destined for friendship. You know, our destiny for each and every one of us in this room is friendship. And Jesus here is saying that, that he is the ultimate friend. Firstly, we have to be friends with him, and then we can be friends with one another through the strength that he gives us. He's saying here, look, I am the ultimate friend. I am the friend who is united with you. When you invite me into, into your life, I'm united with you now and forevermore. I'm the one who's committed to you. No matter how many times you may fall, no matter how many times you stumble or wander, I'm committed to you. I'm faithful to you to the, to the end. I'm emotionally invested in you. You know, when you weep, so do I. I'm honest with you. I'm candid with you. I'm going to help you face up to the realities, those dark realities that you're grappling with, that you're facing in life. But not only that, I'll help you to overcome them as well. I'm humble. I'm your humble friend. I didn't come to be served, but to serve. I'm a humble king who's come to be your savior, to rescue and save. Jesus is saying, I am the ultimate friend. You know, Jonathan here, in, in the act of giving David his royal robes, is a kind of foreshadowing of Jesus stripping himself for us. Jesus laid aside his inheritance so that we could become royalty. He emptied himself so that we could be enriched. And you know, it's, even, it's far greater than what we see with David and Jonathan because we see Jonathan gives David his royal robes. And we notice he gives him all these kingly gifts. But you notice that he doesn't take on David's shepherd boy rags. David would have been wearing rags as a shepherd boy. Um, and, and Jonathan doesn't exchange those things. He simply gives him the royal items. But he doesn't take on David's rags and put them on himself. But you know, Jesus did. Jesus takes on our rags. He gives us his royal robes and takes on our rags. Those burdens, those baggages those things that we're struggling with. He takes them upon himself. He nails it to the cross, puts it to death once and for all. You know, Jesus lost friendship with the Father so that we could have friendship with God. Isn't that incredible? And now we can proclaim, just like Jonathan does in his departing comments to David, we can proclaim, Jesus, surely there is an unbreakable bond between us now and forevermore. Amen.